Hey everybody, it's Lisa Marie here. Hi my sweet lifers. Listen, today we're having another sweet scoop. And for those of you guys that are following on the channel, welcome. And for those of you guys that are listening on the podcast, welcome as well. We are in our second week of Lent and I started Hebrews on Monday, so yesterday. And there has been, it's interesting, there's always a lot of questions. I always have a lot of questions and questions are always good. Um, and so I haven't given the professor or Father Andrew a whole lot of things to think about or to try to answer just yet. But as I've been going through Lent with you guys, I was thinking about a couple of things. And today I want to talk to you about some cross stuff. Because as I started thinking about it, it was like, okay, Jesus tells the disciples after he comes down from the transfiguration that, you know, he's going to go to the cross and he's going to die. And he starts to talk about what he's doing, what is going to be happening. And then he explains to them that if they're going to follow in his footsteps, they're going to have to carry their cross as well. And so there's this carry your cross theme that goes throughout and requests from God and Jesus Christ and throughout the Bible. Well, throughout the, the, the New Testament. And then there's this idea that we need to bear one's burdens or bear the burdens of others or bear your burdens. So there's this idea that you don't have to worry about your burdens. You give all of it to God. At the same time, you have to carry your cross and carry your burdens. And that's part of being a good disciple. And so it's a little confusing. So I started looking at scripture and I started trying to figure out, well, how do I discern what exactly the Bible's saying about that? And what does that look like for Lent? Because we were talking about, you know, almsgiving and, and fasting and prayer. And, and those are the things that we do as Christians during this season of Lent. And I was like, I mean, I understand. I think I've got down. I understand that when you are bearing another person's burdens, you are with them. You're helping them through a horrible time. You're bringing them food. You're kind of doing almsgiving, right? So if somebody's not got enough food to eat and you're giving something to them, then that's part of bearing their burden. You're giving them an opportunity to find some rest and relief in your fellow uh, Christian help to them, right? So that that makes sense if you like have an animal or like for those of you following me on the channel Theodore that showed up at Christmas covered in blood mauled by a coyote you know we weren't thinking about having another cat but he showed up and so you're not going to show up at my door and be needing help and me not give it to you that's just not part of my commitment not only to Christ, but just to humanity, right? Like the whole thing about giving back is, is not, you know, for me, it's obviously from a Christian standpoint, but you know, there's good people and there's bad people. And there's a lot of people that are not Christian people. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're evil either, right? You've got to kind of discern that a little bit and that may get a little pe few people riled up because I don't believe that everybody that's not Christian is evil. Uh, but I do believe that there are certain things that we as just people, humanity, humans need to do, like smile at one another, help one another. A lot of what's in the Bible, honestly, just teaches just that. I mean, you, you need to care for one another and love one another. And that's what bearing one's burdens essentially is. I'm, I'm gathering. I'm, I'm talking to you as obviously the sweet scoop is not a sermon. It is a conversation that I'm kind of giving you about my thoughts about what's going on, not only through seminary, which is really a unique experience I think for me to be able to share with you but my questions as they come up as I'm reading the Bible and studying the Bible in a more deeper way than I have ever done before I did make some notes and I wanted to share this with you because Hebrews is where we started yesterday and in Hebrews 13 16 it says do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such, such sacrifices are pleasing to God so that's clear right that's just as clear as it can be that that's part of it in terms of almsgiving, in terms of Lent, in terms of giving back, in terms of helping one another in whatever that capacity may be, whether it be feed an animal, 
um, or feed a homeless person or pay for someone's meal like we talked about a couple of weeks ago and ideas about ways to start thinking about how to do Lent this year maybe a little bit more purposefully, a little bit more differently. Um, and so looking for people, looking for where you could be of help, looking for where you could, I use the word be of help really in a way that sort of, it's not really the same, but it's kind of the same in terms of bearing one's burden. Because if you see somebody who needs something and you're willing to help them, it's bearing their burden, right? Because it's giving them something that they didn't have. It's helping them along. So that in essentially is essentially is what it is. But um, and then Galatians six two says, "Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ." So that makes sense too. That's that's obviously part of it. And there's two places in the Bible that we can kind of reference about that. But the part about carrying your cross, which is confusing to me, because when you talk about carrying your cross. It means that you're taking your burden and you're, you're, you're self-sacrificing with your burden. You are uh, making an attempt to, as much as we can as humans, uh, withhold ourselves from things that we know are sinful. It's painful. It's like when Jesus was in the garden and he knew that he had the burden that he had to bear and he knew what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem and he knew that he was going to be hung on a cross and he knew what that meant for humanity and he asks God his father if the cup could be passed from him you know would you do it knowing that it wouldn't be but you know he he still was a human right at the, that point he was in human form so he's he's literally weeping bloody tears and he's really fretful about the whole situation and any of us obviously would be in that situation because that's the worst situation you could ever have which is why it's so beautiful what God has done for us and for humanity. But when you talk about carrying your cross, it's sort of the opposite, it feels like to me, which is what was the confusion part. It's like if, if I'm asked to carry my cross and I have to have that cross with me in order to uh, be a disciple, uh, that means that I have to deny oneself. I have to die in my own being all about me, get rid of all the things that are tempting in terms of the world. Obviously, we talked about that last week as well. Fame, fortune, success, uh, whatever it is, right? You know, whatever it is, right? It can be anything. Uh, but your your focus is all on God. And really, it's an interesting concept that's come to me this morning because I was obviously thinking about this for the last week since I was, was last taping with y'all. And I was thinking, okay, what questions am I having right now as, in terms of my own journey? And it's like bearing the cross, bearing the burden. Bearing the cross, bearing other people's burdens. Almsgiving, giving back, but yet being able to take up your cross and know that you have to deny yourself. So if there's a fine line, it's interesting, which is where I kind of came to the conclusion, at least this far in my journey as a Christian, is that there's a line like, you know, if you know that there's someone who needs your help, but every time you give them the help, they abuse the help. Or you know someone is capable of doing something and they're not doing what you know God, uh, no, let me rephrase that. You don't might maybe not know what God wants them to do because we really don't anybody ever really know that. We don't always know that. I mean, we always know that there's certain things that are sort of uh, common to all of humanity, right? be good, like we were talking about earlier, be good, love one another, you know, don't go around killing people, that sort of thing. But at the same time, let's just say you've got somebody that you know, and they're not living up to what you know that they could live up to, right? And they're constantly asking for help. So that's not what God means with this, I don't think. I don't think he means that we're just required to give and give and give and give and give in a circumstance where it's obvious that the person is taking advantage of you or, or, we're not required to bear a cross that is full of angst. I think that what he means is we, we have to take it up and we have to die to ourselves and give our life specifically to him and in his will, trust him to know what's right for us. And I think that's the key. I think the, the biggest key is it's a trust in God 
for all things. So it has nothing really to do with, I mean, it does have something to do with bearing a burden because you're denying yourself of the things that are maybe tempting, right, in this world. Like, cause, I mean, who doesn't want to go on a grandiose vacation and who doesn't see a pair of really nice shoes and think to themselves, well, I just would love to go do have that or whatever it is that they say that they want. But to understand that everything will be provided for you and that the sole focus of your life is supposed to be to help one another and to carry that cross that that's your purpose. Jesus Christ's purpose was to change the covenant between Moses and the Israelites. The no longer having sacrifices in the temple was a main part of that to show that no matter whether you were a Jew or you were a Gentile or you were a whoever you were, a Samaritan, uh, whoever, didn't matter. All of humans were able to, through his shedding of his blood on his cross and him dying and being resurrected, provided all of us with an opportunity to have everlasting life in the kingdom of God. And our, our task is to not only believe in him, but also to die of ourselves in him. And when we do that, we do that when we do our confirmation, we do that further when we do our baptism, we do that all the time. And when we go to church and we're worshiping together, and as we're doing those things as, as a community during this, especially the season of Lent, we're thinking about what we are going to not do, that we are doing, that we know we shouldn't do, or we're also thinking about others that need things that we have and we should give to them, which is really, I think, the lesson in all of it. It's that it's not, we're not to be confused by the carrying of the cross with the burdens being picked up at the same time carrying the burdens of others, which is where the confusion for me went. It was like, okay, I'm confused here a little bit. It's like I've got... First off, I'm supposed to carry my own cross, and then at the same time, I'm supposed to bear the burdens of others. And so what I feel like is really the sort of dissection of that to try to understand what God's Word is trying to say is we need to carry our cross in, the, in this way, accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, understand what He did for us, die unto ourselves, give our lives to him, sacrifice, sacrifice in those ways. But in the exact same breath, we are to, as fellow Christians, love one another, bear one another's burdens, and to help each other when we're in need, which is part of when as well. So there's a denial and there's a helping, there's a trust in him congruent throughout the whole message but there's this yin and this yang, so to speak, which is not really a good analogy, but it's a, you know, it's a yes and a no. It's a yes, do this, don't do that. It's do this, deny yourself, but be able to help others bear their burdens as well. Because honestly, we're all in this together, right? All of us have got the same situation going on. Nobody's going to escape the world without having some sort of a suffering at some point. And at some point, somebody's going to need to talk to somebody. And obviously, they're talking to the Holy Spirit, we hope. But, and Jesus Christ is there, and in his name, he will help you. He said that so many times during the, the New Testament. It's it's just there. Like, it's just, go, go find it, go read it. It's there. Uh, beside us every day, all the time. All the time. The other thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about, which I'm really interested in, and I've been reading about this last week, is... Uh, this business of Jesus Christ when he died going down to hell and breaking the chains in hell and Satan uh, having to deal with the fact that he knew that Jesus Christ had come and the reset there in hell that it, that is a part of the reset of the covenant here on earth with us. And it's real interesting. I mean, it's obviously, I believe in it. I've been believing in it since I was probably 12 years old. But as far as the details, this is the thing that's really interesting to me. Um, that we don't get a chance to go through those details when we're in church on Sunday. 
is that Jesus literally went to hell and was there and he spent some time down there and he was able to release uh, people who had been faithful to, to the Lord who had been succumbed to death because before Jesus Christ came, death had a hold, right? And so it was not until he came and he was on the cross and then he died and was resurrected that he broke the chain of death that Satan had over humanity. Um, and so it was a perpetual state of death. And this is going to go way down a rabbit hole, so to speak, but it's like growing up, I remember thinking that people that died were like in their graves waiting till judgment day or something. I didn't know where I got that idea. But as I've been in seminary and as I've gotten to be obviously older, it's my understanding, and again, not pretending to know it at all, but it was my understanding as a Christian in studying that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and we have the Holy Spirit with us, which is an immediate with us, anointed immediately with us, then we have him with us to guide us in our earthly life. But we have been given and received part of the kingdom with him in us as humans. And when we die, we are already marked his. So we don't go into some sort of a weird middle ground area that we have to wait till his return. Because Jesus Christ's return obviously is the consummation of the kingdom. And we've had, what, 2,000 some odd years or more, uh, give or take, don't know because I'm not a good at math person, but you know, time period that Jesus Christ died and resurrected and has been at the right hand of the Father reigning. So it's going to be a hot minute before he comes back and we never know when he's coming. So those that died before he came, he went down to hell and God, which I thought was pretty stinking cool. Because if you think about it, if he hadn't have gone down to get them, they'd be hanging out with Satan. And then they'd been hanging out with Satan for an awful long time because those of us who are receiving the Holy Spirit and receive Jesus Christ from the point that he came to earth onward are automatically marked into the kingdom of heaven. So I'm, I'm assuming, I'm hoping that when we pass, when we actually leave, leave our earthly bodies, that what happens to us is we don't, we don't have an interim at all. We literally are given immediate access to heaven. And of course the consummation will be when all of the bad and evil in the world will be completely abolished. Like, you know, in a similar way, obviously when God, had the flood and he like wiped out all the evil at that point that he could and of course humanity is still going to be evil and that's why he didn't start over from scratch which is why we've still got that remnant but I think that that may be a good way to explain it to you I mean uh today was kind of like you know I want to figure out how to explain what's this business of the cross we bear our cross but we also have a burden that we share and we can give to other fellow Christians and have them help us. So our burdens are not laid at the cross. Our burdens are taken up in our cross. But we share that opportunity as Christians to share and care for one another as Jesus Christ shares and cares for us. So I think that that's the message. I really, I think that that's the message. And I hope that that has made some sort of a clarification. I hope I haven't confused you worse than, than you already may have been. I know that it was confusing for me. I'm not going to lie. It was confusing because I was like, well, I mean, I understand the two concepts completely, but at the same time, it feels like they're competing a little bit against each other. And they're not really at all. It's just that we have to trust. That trust is the main part of all of it. And I think that when we understand that, that that is like the key to everything. And there's faith that, that you know, all things will be handled and we have the faith that that will be just taken care of, then we make, we make our way through life understanding that by trusting in him, everything will be taken care of, will be given provision. And those provisions come from all kinds of places. And basically in you know Hebrews, it's share what you have, like give, give what you can. Give what you can to people that need things. And that's part of what Lynn is all about, is sharing about, uh, the word of the Lord, which is what I'm doing here with you on Sweet Scoop, 
it's also about sharing our things that we can that are materials that are for people who are in need or sharing uh, a home with an animal that shows up at your doorstep and needs to have food and love and, and tending. So anyway, I hope that that's helped you a little bit along your path this week as long as, as you're uh, studying the Word and learning the Word. I feel like we're heading in the right direction. I don't ever try to have all the answers, but that's where I'm at this week for this week's scoop. So the other thing I wanted to mention is I know behind me, I don't know if you can see it real good, but I've got this beautiful painting and a dear friend of mine who is, uh, it's interesting, you know, there's people you meet in life who are um, people you've known your whole life. And then there's people that you meet in life that you've never known for more than a few minutes. And you automatically know that you've known, you've known each other your whole life. And Charlotte Wharton, Wharton, I should say Wharton, sorry, Charlotte, Charlotte Wharton, is one of those people and I uh, I just am so thrilled about this painting she did a post on Facebook and I saw this painting that she had done and it was just an immediate um, magnet for me I really 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 wanted this painting and for those people who know me know that I don't have anything in my house that I haven't either painted myself or photographed myself unless it's something that my mom or my father did or my children made. And so my house is full of art everywhere, um, and but it's not art that I've bought. And so I was just really pulled to her, pulled to this painting. And, and it's oddly interesting even more so because I've always been pulled to paint uh, nudes and people and never a still life. And so the still life was just, it was like, I don't know. I, it was definitely a God thing, I feel like, because we visited on the phone. I got reached out to her, and we got coordinated on getting me the painting and, and getting uh, getting all the details done with that. And I looked at this painting, and I felt like, you know, it was like me hanging. I made the decision when I, went, when I decided to go to seminary. I was really struggling with the idea of whether I wanted to be in a church as a priest or a bishop, or however that would look, right, um, with a robe and church on Sunday and, you know, doing a service. Or if what church would look like to me would be obviously going to church to see Father and do that in the Episcopalian way, which I do online, and will eventually back in the actual uh, church house. But to be involved in the church in a way that was like more of a church What's the word? Um, I'd have a job there, I guess is the best way to put it. Or if my way of, of doing this navigation of my faith and my studies of the scripture would look like a, a self-study or if it would be something that would be through a master's program. And how would I share the word of the Lord and how is learning about the word even more than I've done, you know, as a, just a regular Christian walking around the world. Uh, with people who I meet and people who come to see me for photos or people who come to see me just in general. And the more I thought about it and the more that I've prayed about it, the more I realized that my service is in in this particular format that we're in right now today, the Sweet Scoop. It's really an opportunity for me to share with you where I'm at it, where I'm headed, what I'm thinking, how I'm learning, the joy of learning through the scripture, uh, different things that you know because it's really a funny thing the bible is one surface is one thing but if you dig deeper and deeper and deeper and you understand the context and you understand the audience it was written for and all the things that you learn when you're in seminary it gives you the opportunity to really delve deep into the word and understand it in a different way so when i saw charlotte's painting it felt like i knew that i was called right i knew i was called to share what my journey is and how that journey has affected me through my faith, through my sufferings, through my experiences in life. But I also knew that I didn't feel like I was being called to be in a church capacity in the traditional sense. And so when I saw her painting, and I don't know if you can see it, it feels to me like there's a scar and of course there's purple and gold, uh, which is 
the colors that we would be using, especially as we go into Easter. Um, and it's like a stole, right? It's like a stole from a gown that you'd wear if you were a priest. And then her use of this metallic paint is just absolutely stunning. And it feels like you've got this vase, you've got this silver uh, pitcher, you've got this box, you've got these gold balls. The balls, when I talked to her on the phone, they're identical and they shimmer. And I haven't shared with you guys yet, so I will today. When I was beginning seminary, you know, we had a lot of boxes of different things that have showed up here from my great aunt and my great uncle and, and my uncle and my, my aunt and things that were of my mother's that it's interesting. She's been dead for 42 years and there's still things that I'm receiving from family members that were hers, which is really kind of cool and kind of strange at the same time. I guess it's like you'd think that I would have already gotten all that stuff, but it's almost like she has made, made sure that I'm only trickled things as I need them, right? So it's like the reassurance for me that I'm in the right direction shows up in the exact same time that I actually need it. Not like all the stuff of your mom's that you got like when you were whatever, like my mom got killed when I was eight. So of course I would have had no use, of, use for or understanding of anything about her having a correspond, correspondence with someone in seminary at age eight, right? In fact, I wouldn't have even seen it as a message at nine or at 20 or at 39 or at 42. It was really right now that I needed to get that, that stuff. And whenever Charlotte and I were talking about these balls, I was thinking to myself, you know, I look exactly like my mother. I'm like an identical carbon copy of my mother. And in some small way, her having painted those two balls that are reflecting off of one another it's like I'm carrying on something that she never got to complete. Um, I, I really believe that, that that is part of my journey. Um, and we've talked about that. If you haven't gone back and you haven't watched the beginning of The Sweet Scoop, where I explained all of that in terms of my history, and one of the reasons why I did that was for some such event as today, is to say, you know, if I start talking about something, I didn't want you guys to be like, okay, I don't even know where she's going with this. Because if you're watching or you're listening on a regular basis, you'll already know that history. But suffice it to say, I look just like her. And I found that when I opened a box of stuff that I was recently given, that she had corresponded with people in Rome when she was in her 20s um, in seminary. And she was very interested, like I am, in studying the Word of the Lord and did study the Word of the Lord. And... But it was not something that I knew. Like, nobody told me that. And then it was like, oh, thank you, Mom, for letting me know that you were doing that now, now that I'm in seminary. Like, now that I'm 53 and in seminary is when I needed to see that or know that and have that in my back pocket. So those two balls for me reflect me and Mommy. It's like a, she rolled off the table and I rolled in the table. She's reflecting off of me. I'm reflecting off of her. And Charlotte, of course, had zero clue when she's painting this, where I would go with this painting and what I would read into this painting. But in the initial box for me, I felt like it was like a box full of the ashes that we have from Ash Wednesday, that a reminder that we came from dust into dust we shall return. Um, it could also be a wafer box. It could also be the body of Christ. You know, it's a, a box that holds this, this body of Christ, the bread of life. And, you know, the, the cup of life, the cup of salvation is the silver the silver pitcher. It's like communion all wrapped up with mommy and Jesus and the Trinity and my Christianity and my decision about how to become a disciple more than I have been before in this last 50 years of life. It's like she painted the whole thing in one painting. And so I, you know, I had to have it. I had to have this painting. And so I'm going to be so excited to be able to share this with so many people that come to see me and and I'm excited to have it be on the sweet scoop and I'm thankful so thankful to Charlotte thank you for making it because I know that when she did it she had no idea what I was thinking where she had no idea but she knows now because we've had a conversation about it and it was kind of like we both were like wow 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 
because as a fellow artist, we're spiritually connected, and as a fellow Christian, we're spiritually connected. But this really has a way more than you could ever imagine meaning for me, and um, totally appropriate that it's at home because it's at home here. Um, and then an added plus, which has absolutely nothing to do with a hill of beans, is that once I got it in here, of course, me being in interior design and just loving decorating as a whole, it absolutely matches the couch, guys. It's like it was perfectly painted for this room. So, I mean, I already knew it was perfectly painted for me, but it was perfectly painted for this room where I am studying scripture and where I am doing the sweet scoop, which is essentially my opportunity to share with you my journey and disciple to you as a fellow Christian. So it's just perfect. It really is just perfect. So anyway, well, I hope that you guys have enjoyed this and I hope that you guys will spend a little bit of time studying the scripture, looking at what taking up your cross looks like, understanding that denying yourself and giving your life directly to Christ is the way. Um, and I just am so full this Lent, I guess is the best way to put it, just full of the Spirit this Lent, more than I've ever been before. And I hope that it's shared, my sharing that has helped to fulfill you as well. So I look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday. I hope that you guys have a wonderful, sweet week, helping each other, growing in your spiritual life with Christ. And I am excited to see you soon on the channel. So you guys see, uh, stay sweet and we'll see you soon. Thanks.